Joining us now from FTN Fantasy, the godfather of DVOA, it's Aaron Schatz. Aaron, how you doing, man? Hey, I'm good, man. Sweltering a little bit in the heat, but uh, try to stay indoors. Try to stay indoors. I hear you. We had uh, two nights ago in Chicago, there was 10 tornadoes that touched down, and the entire (laughs) Chicagoland area had a tornado warning, and I was down in the basement with my dog. It was not a fun experience, but, you know, such is the way the world is headed, unfortunately. Yeah, well, I mean, hey, it's summertime. The heat means it's time for football, right? That means it's time for training camp. We are almost there. Uh, I'm very excited about a week away. Uh, I'm actually in LA right now. We're back in LA in a week uh, to kind of start my training camp travels. Very excited about that. One of my favorite things to do every single year, that just something that has become a ritual, a tradition, is digging into what used to be the Football Outsiders Football Almanac is now the FTN Almanac that I've been reading for 15 years. And the first copy I had, I'm pretty sure this is true, was the Football Outsiders. It was the Pro Football Prospectus is yes. what it used to be called way, way back in the day. And it was, I think it was the 2008 version. That it was, was the, the one with Namdi Astamwa on the cover. Yeah, the first four books that we did were called Pro Football Prospectus because we did it in association with Baseball Prospectus. That's right. And it started in 2005. So this is our 20th preseason annual that I've done with my staff. I think the only other person who's been here for all of them is Mike Tanier. Yep. Although Rivers McCown has done most of them. And uh, yeah, 20 books. The first four then, uh, they stopped doing other prospectuses other than baseball. So we started calling it Football Outsiders Almanac in 2009. And then the move to FTN last year. And This is the second one. That's the FTN Football Almanac. I've read it every single year. I've devoured it every single year. It is such a fun product and such a useful product for anyone who cares about the league. And what I really like about it, and this is something that we're going to dig into today, it's such a great way to check how you feel about these teams. It's a way to either make yourself more optimistic or less optimistic because the way that you guys see this stuff is very cold and calculated. There is not a lot of emotions or even film takes driving the way that you guys are seeing these teams. And one of the teams we're going to talk about today, Rivers McCown, who did a fantastic job with the Colts chapter, he said something that I think is particularly important to remember when we're discussing the DVOA projections for these teams. He said, DVOA doesn't watch the games. And it's such a smart way of thinking about it. And I really enjoy that. And to me, it's a nice counterbalance sometimes when I'm thinking about how things can go right for some of these teams, but also how things can go wrong for some of these teams, which we underrate and undervalue. We watch the games and we do a lot of film study and that ends up in the words. We just don't let that affect the numbers. Like we give our numbers and these are the numbers. And then we write words next to them that sometimes (laughs) will explain why we ourselves disagree with our own numbers. But we're not out here fiddling with our numbers because someone made a highlight play and got us really excited. Which I really appreciate. And again, I think it's a really good way to take kind of a cold, sober look at all of this stuff right before we're about to kick off. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at both sides of the spectrum. We're going to take three teams that the DVOA projections think are going to be better than Vegas and the consensus. And we're going to take three teams that the DVOA projections think are going to be worse than Vegas and the consensus. So let's start on the positive side of this. And let's start with the teams that you guys think are going to be better than Vegas win totals, conventional wisdom, however you want to frame it. Which team do you want to start with here? I'm going to start with the team where I think we are surprising people the most, and that is the New Orleans Saints. I was certainly surprised when I saw the win total next to their name in that chapter. Yeah, so here is my basic take on the New Orleans Saints. They bore people to tears. It's so true. They are very average, very mediocre. They don't have a lot of star players. They're just kind of there. And because of that, people think they're bad. But they're not bad. They're average. And they're average with perhaps a little bit chance of getting a little bit better this year because they hired Clint Kubiak as the offensive coordinator. And we know that those offenses from that school tend to do a little bit better. And they have a very easy schedule in a very easy division. This is a team that lost their division on a tiebreaker last year. 
the idea that they're going to win the NFC South seems ludicrous to a lot of people, and yet to me it seems very natural. Yeah, you guys projected them to win 9.7 games. Their Vegas over-under is 7.5. So that's a pretty huge gap if, if you yeah. look at your numbers and the way that those Vegas projections tend to typically go. And I'm totally with you on this because I've thought a lot about this recently. We, I've had an interesting relationship to the Saints this offseason, but as I think about the way the second half of the year went, the Saints offense in the second half of last year was actually okay, and it was pretty watchable. The problem for me is it was hard to get the taste out of my mouth from what they had looked like in previous iterations of that offense over the course of last season. So I have so many scarring memories of just watching Derek Carr play a disgusting brand of football over the first eight games that the second half of the year, they're pushing the ball a little bit more, Raheed Shahid is involved. They actually weren't that bad. So you guys are banking on the fact that with Clint Kubiak, that we're going to see more of the second half Saints from last year than the, than the first half Saints. Yeah, and that's not to say that the improvement in the second half of the year carries over, because one of the things you'll hear me say a lot totally. about is, as much as we want to believe that second half performance carries over to the following year, the best way to project is to look at the whole year from the previous year, not just the second half. But if you look at the whole year, the Saints were something like 17th in the league by DVOA. And that's what they are. <laughs> They're like 16th or 17th in the league, but with a really easy schedule. And we're not as high on the Falcons as some people are because we think their defense is going to be one of the worst of the league. And Tampa Bay has a little bit of a harder schedule than the rest of the NFC South because they have to play the first place schedule. Mm -hmm. And that leaves room for New Orleans to very boringly win the division and lose in the first round of the playoffs. Like I'm not advertising New Orleans as a Super Bowl contender. I'm advertising them as over seven and a half. Do you guys have Ryan Ramchek projected to play this season? I'm just curious about that because the offensive line, I think, is the area of this roster that is giving the most people pause when you look at the ceiling and what that team might look like on offense. I will tell you that I think offensive line is the position that we have the hardest time incorporating into our projections. Gotcha. Because it's hard to know stats for offensive lines. And mm -hmm. it's hard to have stats for, even if you use something like uh, ESPN's pass block win rate, uh, you don't have that for 10 years to build a system. You have that for like three years. Uh, I think we projected not Ramchick as the right tackle. I think we projected... Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy who plays right tackle if it's not Ramchick. It might be Trevor Penning, Penning. potentially, if yeah, if, if, it if Penning. is going to play left tackle. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's it's interesting because the three teams we're going to talk about that you think could be better than Vegas consensus, whatever, all three of those teams, I think one of the biggest concerns about each it's of them offensive line. is the quality of their offensive line, which is a well, funny the second three team line in particular, them. yeah. And so you you think the offense has to carry this because it was funny to me looking at that nine and a half, nine point seven and I said okay if they're going to win between nine and ten games the defense probably has to kind of return to form a little yeah. bit but you uh -huh. actually have their defense kind of maintaining the status quo you projected them to finish fourteenth in defensive DVOA this season yes last year they were seventeenth on offense and fifteenth on defense we're projecting them fifteenth on offense and fourteenth on defense. So it's just very the most little, average team you can it's imagine. Very little difference. It's I wouldn't say that we would expect the offense to carry the day here. We expect both sides of the ball to be really average <laughs> and boring, just with a really easy schedule. Like I understand that the Saints don't get anyone excited. Derek Carr has been an above average passer by DVOA for three straight years. He gets no one excited. I believe he was 15th last year. That sounds about right. Derek oh, Carr is the 15th best quarterback among starting quarterbacks. Doesn't that sound about right? It sounds so right. The fact that this team is, you have them projected to be 15th and everything is just so spot on. The line from the chapter that I really appreciate it, Scott Spratt, who wrote the chapter, he kind of ends the intro with the New Orleans Saints. Who are you and what are you about? And that's kind of it. It just seems like we don't really have a handle on this team. And there aren't a lot of people, I think, including Saints fans, that are that invested in this team. So right. it's very easy to overlook them in a watered down division. And the idea that they're going to be average with an easy schedule and surprise people is not a positive affirmation of their uh, roster building style. 
And I think the chapter goes into how much we dislike the fact that they keep pushing cap money on year after year because it keeps them 15th. That's what keeps them so mediocre. But it may result in a playoff spot. We'll see what happens. I had a really good conversation with Seth Galina a couple of weeks ago when we were delving into some lingering questions we had about the NFC South. And you know, they needed to do some things and restructure some contracts just to get under the cap this year. But they did not leverage their future this year, this offseason, the way they have in previous offseasons. They're going to be able to make some sort of soft transition here over the next couple of seasons. And I think that's one of the other reasons that it's just hard to get excited about them. Like they feel like a team in transition. They're aging out. They were second in snap weighted age on defense last year. So again, not the most exciting thing in the world to say that the New Orleans Saints are going to be a little bit better than people suppose, but this is the exercise. And, and again, it's why I like the book and why I like what you guys do, because it's quiet reminders about stuff like this. Let's yeah. get to a couple other teams that may be a little bit more notable. The fact that you guys have them projected to finish higher than the general public might. Who's the next team that you wanted to talk about here? The New England Patriots. And of course, I always have to give the caveat that I am a Patriots fan, and it is why I started doing this 21 years ago. But that's You're not juicing the numbers. I can tell. I'm not juicing the numbers because I still think their offense is terrible or likely <laughs> likely to be terrible. Their defense is likely to be really good. Like we put in an extra special penalty for losing Belichick, and they still end up as the number three projected defense for this year. Wow. They were a very good defense last year, top five, not dependent on takeaways. And they are getting back their best pass rusher and two of their three best cornerbacks. All three of those guys missed basically the entire season. Didn't they finish dead last and adjust the games lost on defense last year? I believe that they did, yes. that's it, The fact you can finish dead last, you can be the most injured defense in football and still be what, a top nine. five they unit? Were ninth, they ninth were ninth in defense and like fifth in the second half of the year when those guys were injured, yeah. Yeah, so fifth in weighted defensive DVOA, ball being the most injured defense in the league. And there are other regression-centric things that I was looking at in the chapter that were surprising to me. They had terrible fumble luck. So beyond not taking the ball away with interceptions, they didn't recover a lot of defensive fumbles. The only thing that is probably going to come back to earth a little bit, only the Bears had more accepted opponent penalties last year than yeah, the Patriots that is, did. That but, is something that tends to come back to earth, absolutely. But that's not that doesn't offset being the most injured defense in the league who didn't rely on takeaways. I mean, I think that they're probably right. and they were that's not something to scare player. you off. Yes. Judon is like Judon is like the most important player on the defense. And he was out most of the year. So I think that they are going to be a very good defense. Now they have a very hard schedule and their offense probably won't be any good. So I'm projecting them at seven wins, right? Like I still think this is almost, almost assuredly a losing ball club. Like even if uh, the offense, uh, let's say Brissett plays average or drake may suddenly like becomes the starter and is really good or something i still feel like that they're not going to be better than like nine but i feel like they're going to win games that will end up surprising people because they're going to win some games with defense even against that hard schedule and they have either the lowest or the second lowest over under depending on which book you check I was about to say that seven wins is notable because there are some places where they're projected to win four and a half games, which, which yeah. is the lowest mark in the entire league. So this is now when I'm going to put the human element aspects in here, and I'm going to ask you about them. When do we think Drake may plays? Because if this team is going to win seven games, and if they're going to have anything that's more than the, let's say 27th best offense in the league, I think Drake may has to play most of the games. Because Jacoby Brissett, with this supporting cast, with a first-year offensive play caller that we've never really seen do this, that gives me the willies. Like That well, concerns me about how bad this could be. Yeah, I mean, he was the offensive coordinator in Cleveland when Brissett had his best year. But Stefanski's the play caller. But Stefanski's the play caller. Yes. Um, so the fact that now we're sending him out on his own and he's I mean, potentially we're projecting their offense, offense 30th. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay, so even so, with the 30th best offense in the league, you still think that they can win seven games? Because the, the third best defense. The other part of this, and this is something that hasn't been as relevant in the last couple of years, I think mostly because of the Patriots last year and the Jets. I think it's hard to maintain high-level defensive success when your offense is absolutely putrid. Oh, I can imagine yeah. that in the locker room, it just gets so frustrating. Um, 
but the Jets did. I mean, history is filled with teams that have that once you adjust for field position and opponent strength with DVOA, the 98 Chargers had the third best defense in the league and Ryan Leaf at quarterback. The 92 the Seahawks, Bears. The 92 Seahawks had perhaps the worst offense of the last 40 years and like the number three defense because Cortez Kennedy and some other people, right? Like, like yes, the 05 Bears are a, another example of that same kind of thing. Like, oh, and they, and the 04 Bears too were really good on defense. Yeah. And they were even worse on offense with like Craig Krenzel and whatever, Jonathan Quinn. Like, like I think this defense can still play really well, even with the offense near the bottom of the league. And guess what? If I'm wrong, and they don't win seven games, and they only win five or six, that's still more than four and a half. It certainly is. So as a Patriots fan, putting that hat on for a second, when do you want to see Drake May, and what are kind of the driving forces behind that timeline? If they feel like he needs to learn and we don't see him till December, I'm okay with that. You have to kind of trust them that they know what they've got because of the fact, you know, quarterback, we talk about all the time how difficult quarterbacks are to project. We talk about all the time how highly drafted quarterbacks, some of them still will bust. I don't know what Drake May is going to be. I know that they had the third pick and they took the guy everybody thought was the third best quarterback. And that sounds like the right plan to me. And so now we have to see what happens. It's always an interesting balance between getting experience and not getting the wrong kind of experience. Like I think that yes. too many reps in a bad situation can be bad for young quarterbacks. And this team has no left tackle, no left tackle and a group of receivers that it's very hard to get excited about. Even if you're bullish about Jalen Polk, it's just like, all right. Like, I think that I think Kendrick Bourne, I think Kendrick Bourne is reasonable, but there's just, there's no number one. None of these guys are number no. one. I don't even think Polk is likely to be it. That's, you know, he's like a number two. So they, so they probably have the a bottom three skill position group and a bottom three offensive line with an offensive coordinator that's never done this before as the main guy. Like all those component parts are scary, but there are examples on the other side of it, too. I think that the one I always come back to is I think Josh Allen was well served to get those reps in 2018, even though he was in a horrendous situation. But you never know where the tipping point is with that, where I've the experience is worth it. Research. We've done research, right? When I was at Football Outsiders, other people have done research that answers the question, should quarterbacks play as rookies or sit for a season? The answer is always, I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting because it, like, I, I think another guy – I was, I was asking a, a head coach about this recently because we were talking about uh, a rookie quarterback who started last year, and he said it was good that he played. And even though it was a bad situation, it was good that he played. And we eventually I, – I, we're talking about Joe Burrow, and I think that Joe Burrow is – the mental toughness that you can bring to the position I think ultimately dictates whether or not that experience is good or bad. But I do think that even though Joe Burrow came out on the other side of what that rookie year was like – you can make an argument that there's some like real scar tissue with Joe Burrow. He doesn't want to use play action. He doesn't want to turn his back to the defense. Like he plays the game and wants to control the game, even as they've improved their offensive line, like someone who has played behind bad offensive lines. So even in situations where it's not that obvious that there are lingering effects, I still think you can make an argument that those experience kind of imprint themselves on these guys when they're in bad circumstances early on. Yeah, and so, I mean, that would be absolutely an argument to not play Drake May this year. I I do want to see him earlier than than they probably will play him just because I do think he's going to be He is good the youngest of the to see him. quarterback, so, I mean, the idea of sitting him a little bit makes more sense than the idea of sitting Michael Penix. <laughs> it's a team we'll get to here in a second. All right, what's the last team that you think is going to be a little bit better potentially than the consensus may say? I picked this one not because I think we have them higher than Vegas because I don't know how much <laughs> higher than Vegas we have them. Their over is nine and a half and you guys have the winning 10 games. I think we I picked them because I think it'll surprise people. Um, we have most of the division le leaders from last year as likely to repeat and this is the exception. Uh, I mean, New Orleans tied for the division lead, uh, which is we have Miami ahead of Buffalo. 
So I just think that Miami offense, just everything you believe in, there's no reason to believe that it's going to decline this year. It should be one of the two or three best offenses in the game. I think they should have an average, maybe slightly above average defense. Uh, and their schedule is not as hard as Buffalo's. I wonder the defense specifically, you have a new defensive play caller, obviously with Anthony Weaver going down there. So we'll see how that goes. And then the thing that gives me pause about that defense is just when we're going to see the pass rushers. How do you guys yes. incorporate that into the numbers? Is there like a median that you use where it's like, ah, on average, the, uh, on average, Bradley Chubb will play 11 games. It's How do you like, guys typically handle there's that? There's like a, a, a there's a, a variable that's defensive talent in and out. And if a player is likely to miss for half the season or something, we'll count him as a player as losing a half of, losing half that player. But the thing is, those guys also missed part of last year. So I don't know whether they're going to miss more games this year than they did last year. So like, will the Miami defense play better probably later in the season once those guys are healthy? Yes. But I don't know if it necessarily means that for the whole year, if you average out the whole year, that their defense is going to be that much worse because those guys missed some time last year and this year. I don't know when they're coming back. Yeah, I, th I think and there's average. also like Shaquille Barrett now. Yeah, and they drafted a, so a pass rusher in the first guys. round, obviously, with Chop Robinson. Like, there's a chance that they can stem the tide and kind of bide their time until those guys get back. What's interesting to me is that, again, with Miami specifically, I think that there are elements of who this team is that the numbers have a very hard time capturing, especially along the offensive line. Because if you look at pressures allowed, certain statistical metrics that we associate with offensive linemen, they're fake with the Dolphins. Yeah, like they're not the real. There's no question. They were number one in pressure rate allowed by the FTN charting last year. And there is a sense of that is scheme related. Yes. And they were 31st in pass block win rate, weren't they? So they were 31st. I don't remember pass... exactly, but yes, 31st, 31st in pass walk win rate. We have it in so, the book. Yeah. And so this, so this is the interesting kind of push in the poll with Miami is that there's a very good chance that when their offense is healthy, right? Like that's the, the biggest thing. Teron Armstead, so many other guys on the offensive line, whatever. When their offense is healthy and they're playing in the regular season when that speed can really take over, we don't really see the weaknesses. But when you get a little bit deeper into the season, when it gets colder, first of all, and when you're playing against better defenses and you kind of need a change-up pitch, they're not necessarily built to sustain success in those circumstances. But one of the things that Tyler Lochner, who wrote that chapter, brought up that I think is actually a very good point, it's possible that that offense is so good over the course of the regular season that this team just gets the number one seed in the AFC and they don't have to worry about playing in sub-zero temperatures in Kansas City in January. Yeah, it is absolutely possible. I mean, listen, part of sort of what's going on, there, there's a lot of teams that could get the number one seed in the AFC. Eight of our top 12 projected teams by DVOA are AFC teams, and all eight can't make the playoffs. So, like, yeah, there's a shot that Miami gets that number one seed, but there's also a shot that Baltimore gets it and a shot that Kansas City gets it again and Houston. And it's – I don't know if I would count on it if I was Miami, but it's possible that their offense is that good that it happens. I mean, this is, again, something that's hard to capture with the numbers, but I'm just fascinated by what – the third act of this offense is going to look like because the second act was incredible, right? You go, yeah. you look at the end of the 2022 season and what defenses were doing against that Miami offense. You have teams playing a little bit more physically, you know, they're jamming the receivers at the line of scrimmage. They're disrupting timing. And they struggled with that when they weren't able to play on time. And when Tua wasn't able to play on time and teams were packing the paint in the middle of the field, they struggled. Now you fast forward to 2023. They have all these little kind of tweaks and shifts and with the way that they were using motion to get guys free releases. And now you've kind of moved beyond those issues you had in year one. Last year, they struggled to run the ball downhill when it really mattered. And they struggled again when teams really started packing in the middle of the field. So what is Mike McDaniel's answer to that? And does this team have the personnel offensively to drive that forward? And I think that's ultimately going to be the biggest question with them. But again, that's not stuff that you can really get to and it's not the stuff numbers. that will necessarily matter in the regular season there's a little no. bit of an element here we're talking about how teams are going to do in the regular season i mean this is an element with dallas right the idea that people feel like dallas is going to decline because of their playoff problems no their play whatever's going on with dallas in the playoffs is not a problem in the regular season they win 12 games in the regular season for three straight years so why would that 
why would their playoff problems suddenly show up in the regular season? I, you know, they're going to be good again in the regular season. It's, it's a per, that's exactly right. And again, it's why I have to kind of like reframe this because what I'm thinking is what that Miami team looked like against the Chiefs in the last right. game in, of the season. In what minus I should be thinking, 9,000 degree weather. <laughs> exactly. And what I should be thinking about is what they looked like against Denver in week three. Like, because that's what we're going to see most likely from this Miami offense early in the season. All right. Let's shift it to the negative here. This is the team I was most excited to talk about because when I was reading the chapter about them, I was like, yes, like this is exactly why I love this book because it makes me reframe some of the hype driven teams, some of the ways that we're looking at teams based on little small sample sizes of performance. Who is the first team here that you want to chat about when it comes to a team that you think might be a little bit worse than projections might say? The Indianapolis Colts. It hurts to hear that, but I, I, I'm excited about this discussion. The Indianapolis Colts last year, despite being nine and eight, were 20th in DVOA, right? So the underlying stats suggested that they were not as good as their record. And with that, you combine the fact that you can't expect rookie quarterbacks to be good. And Richardson is effectively a rookie quarterback. And yes, he looked good in the couple of games he played. And the highlights with him are amazing. And the athleticism is awesome. You still can't expect a rookie quarterback to be good. And he's effectively a rookie quarterback. So when you take the, the fact that the team overall was not as good as their record and you add in a quarterback with a very wide range of possibilities, we just don't think this team is as good as the conventional wisdom has them. I want to read this chunk of the chapter from Rivers McCown, who I think did a phenomenal job writing about this team and kind of exploring it on both sides. He said, the truth of this Colts season is that it is very simple. It is a test purely about what Richardson can solve for them. From the grandiose questions about whether he could be a franchise quarterback to the schematic questions about how teams will defend both him and Taylor in an option-enabled attack to the elementary questions that are as simple as how healthy he can stay at the NFL level, how well he lives up to the hype is almost the only thing that matters. The Colts can be a functional team if he's not the next great thing. They did that last year. But if Richard Richardson isn't elevating the ceiling, this team doesn't have much of one. And I love this because there's so many people among the, the, thing, the people on the football internet that look at what he did in those flashes and instantly just assume, well, he's going to. He's going to hit those highs. But you guys are looking at it in this removed way where the sample and the chances of that aren't as high as I think a lot of people are making it out to be. So the numbers are choosing to not believe that everything is going to fall together for this team in the way that I think a lot of other people who are excited by what they saw from him want to believe. And I'm one of those people. And that's why yeah. I really liked reading this chapter. And our projections are lower than conventional wisdom. I didn't pick this as one of my teams to discuss, uh, discuss but also on Chicago and also on Washington. And it's the same reason. And one of those teams, probably, we will be very wrong about. Because one, at least one of those quarterbacks will be much better than the expectation for rookie quarterbacks. But at least one of them will be much worse. And we uh, don't If know I had yet, to bet on one lose? of them, it would be the Colts. If I had to bet on one of them. And the reason is, and I'm curious how you guys handle this in the numbers. The reason that I would bet on the Colts as that team. As the good one. Just, it isn't just because I, I think that getting four games last year and having the mental reps of sitting, I do think that makes him a little bit more than a rookie. I just think that I've seen Shane Steichen consistently put his guys in positions to succeed over the last three years where I haven't necessarily seen that to the same degree with a Waldron or a Kingsbury. Is there any sort of impact and influence you guys have for play callers that it's hard. It, it would be very hard to do because how do you know that the quality of the Colts, is Steichen versus the offensive player, or more likely that the quality of the Eagles when he was their play caller was him rather than who their offensive uh, offensive players were. I will say there is a bonus starting this year for all the guys from the McVay-Shanahan tree. Because if you look at teams with McVay-Shanahan tree guys, <laughs> all other things being equal, those teams just play better on offense. Like San Francisco most of all, but like everybody does. But, I thought the um, you know, you don't know uh, necessarily what Steichen, like what qualities, if, if Steichen had been offensive coordinator for like five different franchises in the past and they'd all been good, 
then you could be like, oh, right, we need to have some kind of a Shane Steichen variable because he matters. Now, you want to do that for like Wade Phillips or something, okay. But the fact is there's very few play callers on either side of the ball that have been on enough franchises that there's a sample size that makes you want to treat them special. And beyond the the sample size, like the, the a control where there's enough different quarterbacks, where there are enough yeah. different circumstances where you can confidently say it's the play caller who's the one that's actually moving the needle. And I thought the Rivers did such a good job of laying out why the Richardson factor here is so important. And it's because the Colts didn't really do that much. You know, they drafted A.D. Mitchell in the second round, and I think that if A.D. Mitchell hits, it does give the offense a slightly different gear. But for the most part, what they're relying on is Anthony Richardson allowing that offense to take another step forward to be more dynamic, to be more explosive on defense. They didn't really do much, right? They drafted Latu in the first round. They didn't do much to the secondary. They're banking on the fact that the flashes they showed as a roster and the progress they showed as a roster is enough where if they could take another small step forward cohesively, and then Richardson is the thing that can bring it all together. That's what's going to make this Colts team the sort of group that some people believe them to be. But again, the margin for error there, it's pretty small. Like landing that plane is not that easy. Yes, you can want it, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Is it a possibility? Yes. Right? Like, can you tell the story of how it happened? Yes. Right? There's some teams where it's hard to even tell the story of how they outperform their projections, like the Giants. But you can tell the story about the Colts. It's just you can't count on it. Yeah, I've, I've been telling myself that story uh, over the last few weeks here. And I unfortunately think I'm going to continue telling myself that story. As much as you scared me off of it, I, I don't think it's enough to completely deter me. All right, let's get to a couple of these other teams. Who is the next team that your guys' numbers say is probably going to be worse than Vegas or conventional wisdom I, might I, say? I believe my second team to talk about was the Atlanta Falcons. It sure was. Um. This is a bad defense. Uh, the good players are in the secondary, but overall, it really feels like this defense is less than the sum of its parts. The linebackers don't excite anybody. The edge rushers don't excite anybody. They lost Calais Campbell. They lost uh, Bud Dupree. Uh, they didn't really replace either of them. I mean, I like the fact that they use some draft picks on defensive players, but very famously, their first round pick was not one of those. <laughs> and on offense, you know, we're expecting a lot out of a 36-year-old man coming off an Achilles injury in a new team with a new, you know, having to learn a bunch of new teammates and new, I don't know how close the scheme is to what he did before, because I know that it's somewhat similar but um we're expecting a lot out of cousins and our, our projections for both the jets and the falcons are sort of lukewarm on the expectations that people expect for rogers and cousins coming back from an achilles injury at that age the difference is the jets have one of the best defenses in the league and the falcons have one of the worst you in the in that chapter, there was a line about just uh, tempered expectations for new quarterbacks in new situations. And I'm sure you guys have you know decades, years of data to back that up. Has there been any sort of small shift in that recently? What we saw from Brady in year one, what we saw from Stafford in year one, those are potentially isolated incidents. But have you guys softened on how hard it is for those guys to have impacts early based on some of the recent examples that we've seen? I don't think so. I think the greatest of the greats have an easier time switching teams like Peyton Manning going to Denver. Are you not saying? Are you saying Kirk Cousins is not Peyton Manning in his prime? Is that what no, and he's good. He's good. Like he's been consistently like the eighth or ninth best quarterback in the league by our numbers. Like he's not. It's not. He's just not like one of the greatest of the greats. And um, so you have to just be a little bit reticent of what he's going to do this year. How about offensive play callers? I, I mean, again, you guys don't have this necessarily baked into the numbers, but do you have any even anecdotal evidence about how long this often takes? Because even the guys who are really, really good, and I, I want to say it was... We gave them the, that bump. We gave them the bump. It's a McVay guy. The right? McVay, so, that, so that's interesting. I think it was in the Eagles chapter. Uh, you guys were talking about how with Fangio even it's taken two years in a lot of these stops. When he went to Chicago in 20, I think it was 20. 17 it would they were fine like they were an average defense in year one and then 2018 is when they lit the league on fire and the other example i think about is the 2015 falcons 
were again probably like the 15th best offense in the league and then in 2016 they were a historically good offense so i'm wondering if there is any kind of accepted time period about how long it usually takes for a new play caller or if it's so all over the place that there isn't a hard and fast rule about it i think it's pretty all over the place but i will say that all other things being equal teams that have to learn a new scheme take a little bit of a step back yeah. And Usually totally you don't fair. you don't necessarily see the step back because that team was already bad the year before <laughs> and regression to the mean is a more powerful force than learning a new system is hard. But learning a new system is hard. Uh, that that feels like exactly what's going to happen with the Falcons potentially is that they were what like 24th, 25th in offensive DVOA last year would be my guess. They were 24th. 24th. That's, that's a pretty good pull by me. They were 24th in offense DVOA last year. I assume they'll probably finish 14th yeah, or so this year. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, I think we're projection. A projection is like 16th or 17th, but yeah. Yeah. So that's more explained by just math and rules than it is the impact of Zach Robinson or proper utilization from offensive skill position players, whatever. So that I think that this is going to be one of those teams. And if they do finish somewhere middle of the pack on offense and they finish with a bottom five defense, the way that you guys are projecting seven and a half wins sounds about right. Yeah. It's just the defense is not good. Like as much as, you know, we talk about this a lot. Analytics people will talk about a lot. It is harder to project defense than offense. Uh, and the range of projections for defense is smaller than the range of projections for offense, right? Like the best offenses are projected to be stronger than the best defenses, but their defense projects pretty bad. I'm curious. How did you guys have the Rams defense projected last year? Oh, I do not remember. Um, probably not among the worst in the league, but because of Donald, I guess, but. I mean, what the Rams had last year was a historically amazing draft. I mean, they had one of those great drafts of lower round picks. I mean, Kobe, nobody, I we would never have expected Byron Young and, and Kobe Turner to play the way that they did. So That's a very good point, because in my mind, it's like, what could the Raheem Morris influence potentially be? But it's more so they need to hit on Ruka Roro and Braden Trice and all of those guys right. they drafted. I mean, the if they round. hit big on those guys, their defense will be better than we're projecting. Let's get to our last one here. Who is the third team that you thought might be a little bit worse than the general public might think heading into 2024? The Philadelphia Eagles. And I know that when people break down rosters and they say, you know, subjectively, let's look at the quality of this roster. The Eagles tend to come out near the top of the league, but the performance just wasn't there last year. Like I, I've said you know, second half performance doesn't roll over to the next year. You have to look at the whole year. But the second half performance was so bad that it made the whole year. They were 14th, 14th for the whole year. Like that's not, doesn't look like a top five roster when you play 14th the whole year. And I just don't see a lot of reason why they're going to be better than that this year. It seems like there's an awful lot of depending on um, rookie cornerbacks. And maybe they'll be really good. I don't know. But uh, I don't think you can count on them to suddenly make this a above average defense instead of another year as a bad defense. There were two things in that chapter. I believe Mike Tanier wrote that chapter, who obviously does a great job all the time. But he had two points that I thought were particularly salient when thinking about how this team projects. The first is, if you look at the entire season, this team was right on pace and right on par in DVOA with the Saints and the Seahawks. And that's right. And we, we want to make the Eagles more than that because of what they were two years ago. But if you look at the entire 2023 season, this is the type of team that we're discussing. And I think that that is a very good, just laid out bare look at what this team was last season. And the other thing that, I th that he said is that teams that typically have two new coordinators struggle and they struggle for two different reasons. One, if you have two new coordinators, like the 2023 Eagles did, it's often a case of brain drain, and that does have a negative impact on what type of team you end up being. The other example is that if you have two new coordinators, it's because you're desperate and you're treading water and you're trying to salvage people's jobs, and that's where this team is. So on yeah. both ends, it typically isn't very successful for these organizations, and the Eagles have seen it from both sides in back-to-back -back years. 
Yeah, I mean, plus the thing I said about it's hard to learn a new system, right? Yeah. Fangio comes in, new new system. Kellen Moore comes in, things are going to change a little bit. It's hard to learn that stuff. The other thing, by the way, I want to say about the Eagles is I think people are discounting what it means to lose Jason Kelsey. Yeah. Like, yes, they were prepared for it. Like, there's no question. The camp Jurgens will, will step in and everything. But um, I think it's very likely that Kelsey is a big part of what makes the brotherly shove work. And it may not work as well this year without him there. And one of the things that you guys wrote and, and pointed out that I think is very important be, with the brotherly shove and with other aspects of this offense, they were phenomenal on third down last year. Like their third down numbers are an outlier compared to their early down numbers. Yes. And based on reading football outsiders and, and DVOA for 20 years, I know that if you have an outsized third down performance, it's probably going to fall back to earth a little bit. And the Eagles are a good example of that potentially. Now in the Eagles defense, their defense was the opposite. Gotcha. Their defense was the worst in the league on third down. And it's likely that that won't continue. So their defense is likely to be better on third down, but yes, their offense is likely to be worse off third down. The Eagles are one of those teams. And I'm, I'm so guilty of doing this. And I do this all the time where we, when teams bring in a new coach or they kind of correct certain weaknesses about their roster, you think, okay, all the things that were good are going to stay the same. And all the things that were bad are now corrected. And that's, very rarely the case that almost never happens. And the way that you guys have them projected and even the way that Mike wrote about them, it's more likely than not that the Eagles are just going to be an average team this year. Like they still have a lot of very good players, but we're in year one of a new system on offense. You're one of a new system on defense. It's probable that the 2024 Eagles are probably going to feel like the 2021 Eagles in a lot of ways when it was Nick Sirianni's first year and they were just kind of introducing this version of the team because this is a pretty hard reset. So if this is just an average team in 2024 with an injection of youth with Bryce Hoff, with some of the DBs, then 2025 is really the year you're looking for. And this is just the year to get everything back on track. And even if Eagles fans don't necessarily want to hear that, I think that's a perfectly acceptable outcome from where this team was at the end of last season. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. Better on offense and worse on defense, but in general, about up that alley. I think that they're, this team is is not the team of two years ago, and there's this feeling like we're just going to go back to the Super Bowl year, and it's not. it doesn't feel to me like that's where things are going. And again, that's why I really enjoy reading this book every single year and just kind of taking a step back and getting a cold look at where things are and just not influenced on narratives and, and, and overstating how much some of these individual pieces can sway the way that these seasons can go. I, I've not no no bullshitting. I truly do read the book every single year and have for the last 15 years. It is a phenomenal resource if you are a fan of the NFL, and I highly encourage everyone to head over to FTN Fantasy and get themselves a copy if they have not already. Yes, thank you. Uh, if you liked all of this discussion, you'll love that we cover 26 other teams in the same depth. And it's, Please go uh, check it out. FTNFantasy.com slash Almanac, or if you want the big printed version, you can search on Amazon for FTN Football Almanac 2024. I'm pretty sure my blurb is on the back of the printed version, right? Your, your blurb is on the back of the printed version and in the Amazon ad. I did not make the front because I think the two people on the front are John Harbaugh and Mina. So, which I understand. I understand taking a backseat to John Harbaugh and Mina. I'm okay with that. Yeah. The John Harbaugh quote was originally very long. So hopefully they don't mind. We had to cut it some to get it on the front cover, but we wanted John Harbaugh on the front cover. I think that's totally fair. I think having John Harbaugh on the front cover of the book is probably a good selling point. Aaron Schatz, sincerely appreciate the time, sir. Always great to chat with you. We will catch up down the road. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, man. 